I will ask you some questions and then I'll let the audience ask you some questions and if you want to ask yourself some questions, feel free and we'll, let's see what happens, okay? Let's start with the case for Israel. Why do we need a case for Israel book? There is no case for France, Canada, even Yugoslavia, which was split into five countries, nobody published a book, a case for Slovenia. It's a great, great question. In fact, when I first proposed my book, it was called The Case for Peace. And I wanted to write a book arguing the virtues of peace, talking about what the peace dividend would look like both for Israel, for the Palestinians, and for the world. And then a student came to see me one day. It was during the Aseret Yemei Chuva, the 10 days of repentance. And he was a first or second year Harvard student. And he said, I need to ask you for tshuva. I said, I don't even know you. How can you ask me for forgiveness? I, you've, never done, you've never wronged me. He said, no, I've wronged you and I've wronged the Jewish people. I said, why? He said, I'm very knowledgeable about Israel. He said, I went to Camp Ramah as a student. I went to Jewish day school. Um, but I'm now at Harvard, and I'm afraid to speak up on behalf of Israel. Uh, I don't speak up in my classrooms when teachers make anti-Israel statements based on ignorance or prejudice. I don't speak up in the bull sessions uh, after class. I don't speak up at the dining room. I said, why not? He said, well, I'm embarrassed to tell you. I said, please tell me. He said, if I am perceived to be too pro-Israel, too pro-Zionist, I won't get dates. Women won't go out with me. I won't be popular. And I was shocked because I grew up at a time when being supportive of Israel was a key to popularity. And of course, the next day I started a campaign at Harvard, uh, support Israel, date a Zionist tonight. Uh, <laughs> may have helped a few Zionists, but it didn't help the cause for Israel. And I decided I really had to write a book, making, outlining the case for Israel. And look, I believe, particularly in a university setting, that we have to acknowledge that Israel is not always right. Its policy decisions sometimes are mistaken, that um, the arguments are nuanced on all sides, that uh, there is truth to both narratives, the Palestinian narrative, the Israeli narrative. I don't believe there's a moral equivalence. Um, I do believe that Israel has the far stronger case, the far stronger argument. But I thought I would write a book that set out a nuanced case for Israel, and in writing it, I decided to try to make the 80% case. That is, I wouldn't support all of Israel's policies. I would support the 80% that virtually all Israelis and all American supporters of Israel agree on. And when I finally did write my second book, The Case for Peace, interestingly enough, I was looking for blurbs for the back cover, and I wanted blurbs from people that represented all points of view in Israel. And so I asked my dear friend Amos Oz to do a blurb. Amos Oz obviously represents a left-wing position uh, in Israel. He's a Zionist, but he's very, very critical of Israeli policies. And I also got another friend, uh, Arek Sharon, to write a blurb. And the idea that Sharon and Oz would agree on anything, they couldn't agree on lunch. Uh, uh, they very, very stridently disagree on many of the policies, but when they saw the case that I made, which was the 80% case, they agreed, and they both wrote blurbs. And that's the case I, I try very hard to make. I'll just tell one more story. The rest of my answers will be shorter, but uh, um, I spoke at a school called University of California, Davis, and there was an audience of about 1,000 students. And um, on one side, I saw students clearly who were pro-Israel. Many of them were wearing kippot, uh, they blue and white and shirts that supported Israel. Some of them stand with us. Um, and on the other side, clearly, there were another maybe 100 pro-Palestinian students with green and uh, flags and uh, Arabic writing. And I said, before I begin my talk, I want to first turn to the pro-Israel students and ask you a simple question. If Palestinian leadership, this was before the split beat, before the, the joinder of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, if the Palestinian leadership in general were to give up terrorism and were to agree to a two-state solution, would you favor a two-state solution in which Israel would have to abandon much of the territory it captured in the 67 war, 
most of the settlements would be ended, it would be an agreed upon two-state solution. Every single one of the pro-Israel students raised their hand and said yes. I then turned to the Palestinian, pro-Palestinian students, I said, I want to ask you a similar question. Would you support a non-settlement, non-occupying, two-state solution where Israel and Palestine live together? They, they huddle together, they mumble to each other, not a single student raised his or her hand. The president of the university who was sitting next to me nudged me and said, you can sit down now, you've won the debate. Uh, the 800 students in the middle clearly saw that this wasn't between pro-Israel and pro-Palestine, it was between pro-Israel and anti-Israel. That the students who purported to be pro-Palestinian students, at least in that group, were more concerned about there being a nation state of the Jewish people than they seemed to care about there being a Palestinian state because they wouldn't accept the two-state solution. So for me, making the kinds of arguments that unify rather than divide uh, is the key to what I've tried to do on university campuses, not always with success. Uh, it's a mixed picture on uh, campuses around the world, certainly a different picture in London and Paris than it is in Montreal and New York or Palo Alto. But, uh, and part of it has to do with the BDS movement, which I know we will talk about. So let's talk about that. I mean, okay. uh, it's Israel looks like he's losing ground in the academic institutions in the USA and certainly in Europe. Now, how critical is it? What can we do about it? What can the Technion do about it? If it's a great question. Um, it is um, Israel as a brand, Israel as an image of positive contributions to the world. Israel is losing ground <clears throat> in American institutions. It has already lost very considerable ground in European institutions and among European uh, intellectuals. I'll mention later on tonight a um, uh, poll that was done by the BBC not so long ago in which they asked 30,000 people from 25 countries, uh, uh, naming countries, have they contributed more good or bad to the world? And the uh, countries at the very bottom of the list were uh, Iran, Pakistan, and then tied for third at the bottom of the list, Israel. Can you imagine Israel being cast in such company? Ironically, the two countries at the top of the list alternated one year with the other, were Germany and Japan, who obviously 70 years ago would have been on the bottom of the list. Um, now, when you compare what Israel has contributed to the world in 66 years, to what Japan has contributed to the world in 66 years. I know we have some Japanese guests here and I don't mean to single out Japan. I'm only singling out Japan because it lists, it rates first in the world. Uh, when you compare the number of Nobel Prize won by the two countries, when you compare the number of high-tech innovations, uh, medical innovations, there's just no a comparison. And so Israel is suffering. BDS is not the cause it's the, it's the result and the symptom. The phenomenon is much deeper. The phenomenon is the phenomenon that drove me to write my book, The Case for Israel, the, the student saying, it's not positive to be identified with Israel. When I was growing up, everybody was pro-Israel. Uh, if you wanted to have a date, you said, I'm pro-Israel. You got a date. You wanted to uh, get tenure at a university. You want to get a job. You can't be anti-Israel. Today, that's changed dramatically. So in the United States, BDS itself does not pose a risk to Israel. No American university will accept uh, any divestment from Israel. Um, it would mean the death knell for that university. I can give you a personal experience. One of my children attended Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts. Hampshire is a very radical school. And a couple of years ago, the faculty voted to divest from Israel, that is, for the university to sell all of its stocks in all companies that have any dealings with Israel. They didn't think about what that would mean, but they just voted for it. And as an alumni parent, I started a campaign to divest from Hampshire College if they divested from Israel. The president of the university called me, basically on his hands and knees, pleading me, 
pleading with me to stop that counter campaign, and he promised that they would rescind the resolution and that Hampshire would never divest from Israel. Um, just another anecdote to show the story. One night at three in the morning, I started to get a series of phone calls saying Harvard has a fund to invest its enormous endowment, uh, and one of the funds has just sold off all of its Israel stock. Call a friend of mine who is, in fact, very knowledgeable in the stock market. He checks on the computer. It's true. And then I keep getting calls from alumni and alumni. What's going on? Is Harvard divesting? I waited a decent amount of time until about 7.30 in the morning, and I called the president of Harvard. I said, is it true? She said, I know nothing about this. Let me check. She calls back and says, it's true, and it's good. I said, it's true, and it's good. Why is it true, and it's good? It said, last night, the world whatever voted Israel into the economic whatever it was a couple of years ago. Remember when they were voted into the European? And that automatically changed Israel's status from a developing nation into a first world economy. And they're, they have a fund to, develop, to invest only in developing nations. And the fund automatically by computer sold the stock of all countries that were now promoted. So Israel was promoted out of that. And of course, within one hour, that amount of money was invested in a fund that invested in first world investment. So the sensitivities are very great. And no American university would dream, I believe, of divesting. Certainly no American university would engage in an academic boycott. One more story about that. I promised you my answers would be short. I lied. Um, so a few years ago, there were a group of students led by, again, language, modern language. Modern language somehow just uh, doesn't like Israel. Uh, maybe does Noam Chomsky have something to do with it? I don't know. Do his students have something to do with it? I don't know. But modern language just voted again to boycott Israel. But this started a few years ago. And there was a campaign. So two of us, Steve Weinberg, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics some years ago from the University of Texas, and I drafted a letter, a very simple letter. Both of us had honorary degrees at that point from an Israeli university. Um, and so we wrote letters saying, we are alumnus of Israeli universities, and for purposes of any academic boycott, we want you to know we deem ourselves Israelis. So if you boycott Israeli academics, you must boycott us. And we sent it around to a few hundred of our colleagues, hoping maybe 20 or 30 would sign, and we'd get a letter in the New York Times. Well, we were surprised. 20 and 30 didn't sign. 11,000 American academics signed a statement saying, for purposes of any academic boycott, we are Israelis, Jews, non-Jews, Zionists, non-Zionists, people who had connections with Israel, people who didn't have connections with Israel. It immediately destroyed any effort because the end result would be you boycott Israel. You're being boycotted, essentially, by 11,000 prominent academics. And so they would be the victims, essentially, of their own uh, boycott. Today, by the way, if the same thing happened and if Steve Weinberg and I sent out the same letter, we would not get 11,000 signatures. We might get five or six. We would not get 11,000 signatures. Uh, the situation has changed. A boycott wouldn't get 11,000 signatures, but more today would say, not my issue. I don't think I'm getting involved. I'll stay out of this one. And so, you know, it's, it is a serious issue. And it's a long-term issue because my students and my grandchildren's generation today who will be the leaders. When I look at my class at Harvard Law School, I don't just see students. I see the future president of the United States sat there, uh, the future Democratic candidate, she sat there, the future chief justice sat there. This is all true, of course. Uh, all of those students passed through our classes. So these are the future leaders, and if they're being educated with an antipathy toward Israel today, that may influence policies in the future. There's no short-term danger in the United States. There is a short-term danger in Great Britain and in France and in some European countries. But it is critical, right? Hmm? It is very critical. It is very critical. One has to think about the long term. Yeah. Okay. 
the BDS is also trying to boycott Israeli products, and uh, they, they differentiate between products developed or manufactured in Israel and products of the territories. I am an industrialist, and I find it difficult to differentiate sometimes which product comes from where. What's your take on that? It's a tactic. It's a tactic. The BDS movement figured out if they can get the foot in the door and get some boycott, they can then expand it. So it starts by just boycotting products made in the territories. And then they show these horror films about how deep into the territories some of these places are. And you know, you should. Then the next step is boycott products made in Israel until Israel ends the occupation. But then you see what Burgudi and others who are the founders of the BDS movement are saying to their own people. They're saying the boycott, the divestment movement will continue until Palestine is free from the river to the sea. That the boycott is aimed not at Israel's occupation of the West Bank, but of Israel's occupation of Haifa and of Tel Aviv and of Lud. Uh, uh, and so it is clearly the beginning of a tactical three-stage step. And it's very complex because let's take the territories. I can easily see an Israeli or even somebody outside of Israel saying, look, I don't want to support the settlements deep in the West Bank. If I see a product that's coming from that settlement, maybe I can do something about encouraging Israel not to have settlements deep in those territories. I won't buy that product. But what is the center, what is the focus of the campaign against products made in the territories? SodaStream. Where is SodaStream? In Malaya Dumim, in the industrial part of Malaya Dumim, but Malaya Dumim nonetheless. What is Malaya Dumim? Americans don't know, Europeans don't know. Europeans don't know that Abbas himself has personally said that he and the Palestinian people have no expectation of Malaya Dumim Gilo ever being part of a Palestinian state. So I have actually tried to broker a deal. Here I'm going to get political for a second, but just descriptively political because I'm sworn to stay away from politics. Technion has a great reputation for depoliticizing discussion uh, uh, among faculty and students, and it's a great thing. I don't want to interfere with it. But my proposal has been to, tell, to ask a boss, and I'm hopefully going to see him, to ask a boss whether he would accept the following proposition. I've already asked him previously, and he has indicated in a different context the possible willingness to do that. And that is if Israel agrees not to build any settlements or increase any settlements that are outside of the security boundary in areas that will clearly become part of a Palestinian state if a two-state solution is agreed upon, would you, the Palestinian leadership, agree not to protest or criticize Israeli building in areas that you know for sure will remain part of Israel in any two-state solution? I don't know whether the Israelis would agree to that. I don't know whether the Palestinians will agree to that. But from a moral point of view, to me, there's an enormous distinction between products that come from areas that will remain part of Israel and products that come from areas outside of uh, the, what will become part of Israel. Now, for those who believe in a one-state solution, either a Jewish one-state solution or a Palestinian one-state solution, those distinctions, nuanced distinctions, are meaningless. But to many, the distinctions would be, I think, meaningful. Also, I would never, ever accept a boycott as moral that focuses only on the nation state of the Jewish people. For me, that's always going to represent bigotry. If you want to start boycott movements, start with the worst first. List all the countries in the world, not the way the branding studies that I talked about do it, but in some objective way. List the countries in the world that have human rights violations and boycott in order of the seriousness of the human rights violations. Uh, you know, you can't get a demonstration today against Syria with the barbarity that's going on. You couldn't get a demonstration even against what was going on with the kidnapping of the women in the Sudan and other horrible, horrible violations. Any, any effort to stigmatize Israel and only Israel 
outside of the context of a broad human rights approach is, to my mind, bigoted. Now, I make a distinction between Israelis and non-Israelis. As an Israeli, you're entitled to be much more critical of your own country than of any other country. As an American, I'm entitled to impose a double standard on my country. But no Presbyterian from Minnesota has the right to vote to divest from Israel if he hasn't first voted to divest from Cuba, Afghanistan. I can go down 170 nations that would come first. A Presbyterian in Detroit cannot impose a double standard. The Catholic Church in the Vatican cannot morally impose a double standard. They cannot expect more of a country because it's the nation state of the Jewish people because to do that is to expect less of other countries. And that becomes a green light for human rights violations. It says to the people of Rwanda or Darfur, it's okay for you to slaughter each other. You're not Jews. But the nation state of the Jewish people, we expect more from you. Uh, and that's not acceptable. So for Israelis to do whatever it takes to change policies that they disagree with, I have no quarrel with that. My quarrel is that Israelis sometimes are so narrow-viewed that they don't understand that the exaggerated criticisms they make of the policies of their own government don't stay in Israel. They become grist for the mill of haters of Israel who then say, see, even in Israeli. That's why I'm so opposed to the students, young people, well-intentioned people who served in the army and come back and come to America and say, oh, our army is so brutal. These kids have no idea about the comparative way in which the Israeli army acts with the way other armies act. Every country in the world could have people who served in the army coming back and say, my God, we didn't realize war is really hell. But when you have these students go around speaking on university campuses, the, imp the impression is there's no army more brutal than Israel's. There's no government more repressive than Israel's. There's no occupation worse than Israel's because Israelis are so verbal and so articulate and so global that they make their domestic case internationally and therefore create the misimpression that Israel is the worst. That's why another British poll showed that people were asked to rank the country in the world that is most dangerous to peace, the most dangerous country in the world. Israel won that one hands down over Iran, over Iraq, over Afghanistan, you name it, Israel was number one. Because if you ask Israelis uh, who care deeply about Israel, it's their number one problem. And your number one problem gets extrapolated into the number one problem of the world. And that's an issue that we have to deal with. I forgot to mention that you received many, quite a few honorary doctorate from... But this is the most important one, <laughs> believe me. It's not Next even... Next question. <laughs> Israeli officers are being sued in many countries you know, and uh, for crimes, and then the Interpol gets in and they, there is an international warrant, etc. Is there, is there any advice that you can give us, them? I mean, those are people who really yeah. did oh, yeah. what we send them to do. Well, first of all, not only can I give advice, I have given advice. Okay. Um, I will repeat here what I've said over and over again. I will, without charge, without expenses, represent any Israeli official arrested anywhere in the world for performing duties as an Israeli official. I will do it, and I will put together the best legal team that I am capable of putting together. And I've already spoken to many lawyers in many parts of the world. We stand ready. Um, I think it's no secret that when uh, former General Shkedi um, flew to England a few years ago and was threatened with arrest, um, I was standing by. Danny, my friend here, uh, was uh, on the phone, ready to relate to me anything that happened to Shkedi. I was ready to get on a plane. And up here, we had a British lawyer standing by. So far, nobody has been subject to a full judicial proceeding. We've gotten Britain to change its law, and it's much, much harder today in Britain 
for individual radicals to select, selectively prosecute those they uh, disagree with. It's still a problem in Spain, although the Spanish government's approach has now changed somewhat. Um, if I were an Israeli, I have to tell you I would take a different view from what I think some Israelis are taking. If I were an Israeli, I would march into Britain. I would present myself at the police station. I would have my hands out ready and say, let's have a trial. Let's put Israel on trial. Let's see what it will look like when we do a comparative analysis between Israel and the rest of the world. Let's see how a judge or a jury reacts when I can prove to a jury that no country in the history of the world, none, faced with threats comparable to those faced with Israel, has ever had a better record of human rights, a better record of being concerned with civilian life of its enemies, and a better overall record of proportionality in the state of Israel. None. And when I go and I speak, doesn't mean Israel's perfect, doesn't mean it can't do better. But when I go and I speak at universities anywhere, in Paris, in London, in Italy, no matter what, I issue the same challenge. I stand up and I point and I say, any one of you in the audience, name a country faced with comparable threats that has ever had a better record on these regards. And occasionally a hand will go up and people will laugh at the student when you look and see what those countries have done and how brutal they've been, including my own. Um, give you an example from General Shkedi. When he became head of the Air Force, the ratio of civilians to Israelis, I'm sorry, civilians to combatants who were killed was among the best ratios in the world. That is, for every civilian, for every terrorist who was killed, there was one collateral death of a civilian. In the United States, the ratio was about one to 30. That is, for every terrorist killed, there were approximately 30 non-combatant deaths or serious injuries. And in the United States, that was regarded as an acceptable ratio to stop terrorism. By the time Shkedi left, just before the war in, in Gaza, um, the ratio, he, he insisted on changing the munitions, changing the intelligence requirements, and of course there was, some, there was a price to pay for it. You'll recall that when they tried to get the Hamas military leadership that was all together in a building, they used a very small bomb. The small bomb hit the target, but because it was such a small bomb, everybody escaped. Had they been able to use the munitions that they had previously used, every one of them would have been disabled. Uh, so a price is paid for it, and you don't know how to measure that price in deaths of innocent Israelis or rockets uh, that traumatize innocent Israeli uh, children. By the time Shkedi left, the ratio was for every 29 terrorists killed, there was one fatality. That's how, how much he improved. And that, by the way, comes from Haaretz, not the best friend of the Israeli military under all circumstances of Israel. And of Israel. Well, you know, they think they're friends of Israel. And, you know, having said that, let me just make another point. Look, criticism of Israeli policy is not anti-Semitic. I've never suggested that. I, w I don't believe it. Because if criticism of Israeli policies were anti-Semitic, the largest concentration of anti-Semites in the world would be in Tel Aviv <laughs> and, and uh, readers of Haaretz and other such newspapers. No, that's not what the point I make. The point I make is that you cannot understand the fervor of the hatred of Israel among some Europeans, particularly some Europeans, without recognizing that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and Israel is the Jew among nations. The discussion in Europe is utterly without nuance. There's not a conversation about Israeli policies. It's a criticism of the very concept of a nation state for the Jewish people, and it's done with such fervor and hatred that anything associated with Israel, even something like the Technion, which produces so much good for the world, helps cure so many illnesses, helps feed so many hungry people, even that gets tainted, even despite the Technion's wonderful globalization and movement to so many areas of the world. And the Technion is fighting it, fighting it in the best way you can fight it, by making Israeli science indispensable to the world making it impossible to boycott Israeli products. And that's the essential way to do it. And the Technion does more to fight 
the BDS movement by its brilliant innovations than any speaker than any uh, Hasbara can ever do. So believe me, three cheers for, for the Technion. And one of the reasons I'm so honored to accept your honoring of me is because you do so much for the world and you do so much without being political to fight the BDS movement. We are in Israel, so let me be go into a little bit of a critical issue. Sure. You know, we have a finance minister and a president in jail. We have prime minister. <laughs> I know. They generally, people who are in jail generally call me. So I'm fully aware of how many people you have in jail. Yeah. But you're not the only country. I was called by no. uh, Bill Clinton called me when he was in trouble. I represented the president of the Ukraine uh, a couple of years ago, President Kuchma. Recently got a lot of phone calls from the Ukraine. So, uh, oh, I'm now representing the former president of Ecuador. So you're not the only country that has that problem. But, but we do excel in some. I mean, we have a prime minister on the way to jail. We have a chief of staff. Your in, prime in minister is still, still, wait a minute, there's still an appeal. Yeah, so right, I he's agree. Not, but he's uh, not going to jail yet. Okay. okay, I'm trying to. And the <laughs> chief of staff is under investigation right now. So during the last election, I, I don't know if you followed it for I the do. president. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there were quite a few candidates who withdrew because questions were started to be asked. Now, w what is wrong with us, with our system, with our leaders? Well, Okay, it's a, very, it's a very deep question, and it's a question about which I am not particularly qualified to answer. I will try to answer it within the limits of my expertise. I can tell you this, that in Israel, more political leaders are indicted in general, and fewer are convicted. That is, there's an enormous disparity between indictment and conviction when it comes to public figures. If you go back 20 or 30 years, you will see how many Israeli public officials have been subject to indictment, and how many of them were either cleared or cleared of most of the charges. Now, that's not been the recent experience. The recent experience has been those charged have been convicted, so maybe there's a change. But when there was an enormous disparity between the charging and the conviction, there was something wrong with the system. Every democratic system convicts about between 80 and 90 percent of those people who are charged. You know, people complain to me all the time, you represent guilty people. Of course I represent guilty people. I'm a criminal lawyer. Thank God for the fact that I represent guilty people. If I represented innocent people all the time, that might be Iran or China. The vast majority of people indicted in America are guilty. Thank God for that. Uh, and the same thing is true generally in Israel, which has an 80 to 90 percent conviction rate, but not when it comes to corruption. When it comes to corruption, at least until very recently, the rate was more around 40 or 50 percent. That's too low. Now, I don't know enough to know whether too many people are being indicted or too few people are being convicted. Whether there is uh, too low a threshold for indictment or too high a threshold for conviction. But the disparity was troubling. In the last couple of years, of course, the president of Israel, the reason the president of Israel is in jail is because he made a stupid, stupid legal mistake. Um, um, I'm not talking about the ultimate crime itself, which if he committed it is, is beyond being despicable. But he's in jail because he made a stupid legal mistake. Whether he did it with the advice of his lawyer or without the advice of his lawyer, I don't know. But he was offered a deal to avoid imprisonment if he simply pleaded guilty to lesser offenses that would not have carried a prison term. And the attorney general was criticized or well, the director of public prosecution was criticized for giving him that deal. And in defending their decision, they went in court and they said, we had to give him that deal. We couldn't prove the more serious crime of rape. So Katsir says, wow, the prosecutor said publicly, they couldn't convict me of rape. Why should I have pleaded guilty to the lesser offense? I'm now going to withdraw my plea of guilty to the lesser offense and stand trial for rape. They can't put me on trial for rape. They've already said that they have no evidence. Of course, they weren't bound by that. They developed more evidence. And as a result of trying to outsmart the system, he ended up in jail for a significant period of time, uh, a, a sentence he could have avoided. On the Olmert matter, um, uh, 
former Prime Minister Omer is a close friend of mine, and I'm, I'm not going to, at this point, comment. I don't know enough except to say that the issue is still pending uh, on appeal. There are some very serious issues in the case uh, from the press reports, including reliance on a witness who died without having been cross-examined. And uh, the legal system of Israel is a very good legal system. Um, and um, I'm confident that it will produce a just result. But it's a tragedy because, you know, the old notion going back 2,000 years to being purer than Caesar's wife, that when you're elected to high office, you have an obligation. You have an obligation to the people. Uh, you have an obligation. And, of course, there are two kinds of things. One, when you commit the crime after you've been elected, and that's something that people can't know about, and when you're elected after it's widely known or widely suspected that you've done things like that. And that, in part, the people deserve some blame for that when they elect public officials who have reputations for corruption or dishonesty. I hope this marks a watershed in Israel's history. And I hope the election of the new president, who people you know, had all kinds of things, positive and negative, but everybody seemed uniformly to acknowledge that this is a man who is beyond any suspicion of any kind of either corruption or sexual misconduct or anything of that kind. I hope that marks a watershed in the end of this shanda, uh, which is what my grandmother would describe it as. And it's not only a shanda for the state of Israel, it's a shanda for the Jewish people to have highly elected officials who even come close to lines of that kind. So I hope we're talking about past history, and I hope the future will be better. I think you're right. <laughs> Different subject. What can we learn from the Arab Spring? What we can learn from the Arab Spring is that the Talmud was right when it said that prophecy ended with the destruction of the Second Temple. <laughs> we have no ability to predict the future. Yogi Berra once said, Predict prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> and the Arab Spring caught everybody off guard. Everybody was caught off guard. There wasn't a single intelligence agency in the world who anticipated either the spring or the conversion of the spring into winter. Um, and uh, we, you have to make decisions based on Bayesian analysis. And I would hope that the Technion would teach courses in decision making based on uncertainty and probability and how you weigh the various costs of a type one era versus a type two era. This is the kind of thing that statesmen and diplomats and stateswomen have to understand that you have to make decisions without being in any way sure of what will be happening in the world six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, certainly not two or three years from now. Um, uh, yesterday, we took a wonderful trip, my wife, my friends, and I, to the Golan. And you stand on the top of the Golan, and you remember the Syrians shooting down. And you think about what would have happened if Israel had returned the Golan in exchange for a promise from Assad of real peace. Uh, and uh, then you look at what's going on in Syria today. I'm not saying that's an argument for not making a peace that would require surrendering the sovereignty of the Golan but maintaining a presence for the next 50 or 100 years. I I'm not here to make political decisions or military or strategic decisions, but I am here to say that anybody who thinks that they know what the Syrian regime or the Syrian government will look like a year from now is Meshuggah. My friend here today uh, who's with us, Michael Miller, is a very distinguished psychiatrist in America, and he should move here permanently if people are making decisions <laughs> based on what they think they know about what Egypt will look like, what Turkey will look like, what Jordan will look like 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. We cannot know. We were not endowed by our creator with the ability to think forward. We're very good at thinking backward. We're very good at analyzing our mistakes and perhaps even learning from them. But that, to me, is the major lesson of the Arab Spring. You know, between Jews, even the past has changed. 
He's yes. cheating on you. Well, I uh, think it was uh, Martin Buber, I'm going to quote him later tonight, who said, the truth isn't what it was used to be. So, you know, when I look at the results of American foreign policy, I'm not excited. I get very excited. Yeah. Different meaning so of the word. So what's your opinion? I mean, Iraq, what's happening now? Egypt, Syria, Iran. First of all, look who we elect to be presidents. Without getting involved with Democrats or Republicans. A lot of people think Bill Clinton was a great president. He's a friend of ours. We like him a lot. He was really qualified to be president. He had been governor of Arkansas. You know what Arkansas is? I mean, I, didn't want, I wouldn't even mention a city in Israel that's comparable. But, I mean, being governor of Arkansas? How does that qualify you to be president of the United States? Barack Obama, a couple of years before he was elected president, was a street organizer in Chicago who had never been elected even to a single office, had never had any experience in foreign policy. Both of them are very, very smart. On the other hand, George W. Bush, the first George Bush, was the most highly qualified person to be elected. He had had every position in America. He had been the head of the CIA, head of the Republican Party. He had been the ambassador to China. And he screwed up every single job he ever had. But that qualified him to be president of the United States, a job which he also screwed up. So, you know, at least in Israel, with all the disadvantages of the Israeli system and the craziness of the parties and how you, at the very least, before you get elected prime minister, which is really just the prime among the ministers, uh, you have to be a member of the Knesset. You have to have been in the Knesset for some years. You have to work your way up. The same thing is true in England. You have to start as a backbencher. You eventually work to the leadership of the party. You are in the foreign ministry. You do all of these things. At least there's a way of qualifying you. We have presidents by luck. Presidents by luck and presidents by charisma. And particularly foreign policy suffers as the result of it. I suspect m most of our foreign policy decisions are, are, are made uh, uh, without real experience. So it doesn't surprise me. But uh, you know, let's remember how ironic some of the issues are. So we think of Shimon Peres as a man, a great man of peace. I love Shimon Peres. He's a fantastic, wonderful president. I've known him since he was director general of the Ministry of Defense back a hundred years ago. That's how long, long ago we know each other. But, but remember that he urged the United States to go into Iraq. And who urged the United States not to go into Iraq? The former Prime Minister Sharon, who was regarded as a hawk. So uh, you, know, you, you never know who, who makes the right decisions, who makes the wrong decisions. Shimon Perez argued against the Osiric reactor. Um, was, in the end, was that a good decision? I think it was. Some people think it wasn't. But you have to look back and judge your leaders not only based on what they advocated but what they opposed and look at history and see uh, what we can learn from that. I think, again, what we, what we can learn is one has to be very modest, not have great expectations. I worry very much about American foreign policy. I worry that the Iranians don't believe our president when he says that he will not allow them to develop nuclear weapons and he will take whatever means are necessary. I, he's telling the truth, the president. He looked me in the eye, I know him very well. We sat like I'm sitting next to you even closer. And he said to me, Alan, you know me, you've known me for a long time. I don't bluff, you can take it to the bank. When I'm telling you that I will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons, I will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. He would pass a lie detector test. He was telling me the truth. The problem is no president can anticipate what the future will hold. He would have also told me, sitting at that table, we didn't have that conversation, you can take it to the bank, I guarantee you that if Syria develops and uses chemical weapons against their own people, there will be a military response. He was telling the truth when he said that. He wanted there to be a military response. Congress wouldn't let him. We don't know how Congress would respond if the president tried to use military action against Iran if the president believed that Iran had crossed certain red lines. And so Israel can never, ever outsource its defense to any country, no matter how close the alliance is. Israel must always have the ability 
to defend itself. And I said that to the president, and he agreed with me. I said, Mr. President, you cannot expect Israel to outsource its defense and to rely on the word of an, of an ally. I quoted, as I've done in writing many times, Elie Wiesel, who said that for him the lesson of the Shoah is always, always believe the threats of your enemies over the promises of your friends. And Israel has to A, believe the threats of its enemies, and B, it has to not count on the promises of its friends. It must have the capacity to do everything necessary to defend itself. And believe me, if it comes to that, the Technion will have played a central role in Israel's ability to defend itself. And that's a good thing. Don't let anyone ever, ever frighten the Technion or any other Israeli institution into not doing its duty of helping to defend the country from the horrors that it could face without a strong defense. Those of you who, who go, to, go to shul uh, will remember that how many times a week do we repeat the phrase, Hashem oz le'amo yitain, Hashem yivarech et amo b'shalom. God will first give the Jewish people oz, strength, and only then will there be peace. Uh, the one lesson of being a Jew and of being the Jew among nations is there can never be peace without strength. The lesson of the Holocaust is we thought that having morality on our side was enough. It wasn't. Imagine how different the world would have been if there were an Israeli Air Force in 1941 and 42, if Israeli troops could have worn the citizens of Rhodes, could have helped try to protect the people of, um, of Hungary who uh, walked to their deaths uh, without knowing what faced them. Uh, there will never again be a Shoah because of Israel and because of the Technion. There will never again be a situation where Jews are unable to defend themselves and to deter and prevent the kinds of horrors that the world has once or more than once inflicted on the Jewish people and many in the world would like to see inflicted on the nation state of the Jewish people. So never be ashamed of strength. Use it morally, use it properly, but never be ashamed of strength. I'm taking you to a different issue. Rwanda said, that, and I know you respect him, that we can have democracy or concentrated financial power, but not both. If Rwanda would have alive, been alive today, what would he say about the US and about Israel, by the way? We are very similar in that respect. Well, I think um, Brandeis would be very much opposed to what is going on in the United States where the wealthier getting wealthier and the poorer getting poorer and the disparity between wealth and poverty is increasing dramatically. Um, it turns out the trickle-down theory has not worked, that uh, it was believed by some that enhancing the wealth of the very wealthy would increase not only the relative uh, uh, wealth of the poor, the absolute strength of, of the, the absolute wealth as well. That just hasn't proved to be true. And the, where it shows most is in education, and that's the tragedy because education is money, and education is power. Education is money in two ways. One, in the United States, unlike in Israel, you need money to have an education. I mean, to its credit, um, if you're a, a brilliant young student here in Israel, uh, comes from a very poor family, you could you can get into the Technion. You can. Uh, graduate with distinction here. You can't do that in the United States for the most part. The United States, we start our discrimination at the earliest level, at kindergarten, um, and uh, it operates through the entire system. And money d determines whether you will get a good education, and money determines whether you will become computer literate, technologically literate, genetically literate, all the kinds of tools that are required I teach my students at Harvard Law School, if you want to be a good lawyer, you have to know science, you have to know genetics, you have to know technology. Um, and, and we're getting wealthier and wealthier people excelling at universities. And it, it's money in another way. Uh, if you obtain the tools educationally, you can be very, very wealthy and be very successful. And if you don't, you will drop further and further down. Uh, if, you, if you graduate, wherever you graduate from, and don't have computer technology available to you, you cannot be successful. And so I see the problem getting worse. And uh, Israel, which is among, maybe it is the 
uh, most computer literate country in the world, uh, computer user country in the world, uh, technologically, technological computer country in the world, has an obligation to, to spread that knowledge as deeply as possible. That's, it's a real national security threat when a country has lots and lots of people as its own citizens who are not able to really operate within the economy. So Brandeis, as usual about so many things, was right. <laughs>